Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tangislav, and today I will do the brief introduction, uh, brief practical introduction to NeoFest together with my colleague, uh, Alexei. Uh, so uh, we represent the Neo St. Petersburg Competence Center, and we are the R&D company based in St. Petersburg and created to uh, support and work on Neo uh, ecosystem and NEO projects. Uh, so our main projects are NEOFS and NEOGO, which is uh, Go implementation of uh, NEO blockchain node. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce the main concept of uh, NEOFS and then uh, Alexei will uh, have the practical demonstration on how to use it uh, from your command line and how to prepare everything to, to integrate it to your software. So uh, NeoFS, uh, as something said, is a decentralized object storage, uh, tightly integrated uh, into Neo N3. Uh, actually, it's integral, integral part. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what are the key differences uh, of NeoFS compared to other similar projects? Uh, so at first, uh, we try to do the truly decentralized storage system. And that's particularly an object storage. It means you do not store files, you store the uh, fixed uh, pieces of data uh, and they are actually immutable. Uh, we do not try to store anything uh, data related on chain. Uh, so we divide our uh, nodes into different type like in-ring nodes that take care of the uh, overall network health and storage nodes that do the actual data storage. Uh, the blockchain here is used uh, to synchronize actions between all those nodes. And technically, the whole NeoFS system is just the D app on the Neo N3 platform. Uh, and uh, the nodes, the, the system itself has its own protocol. Uh, it's uh, gRPC-based API, but also we support uh, the different uh, gateways uh, like S3 protocol gateway, HTTP, etc. Uh, and um, one of the key features uh, that are very useful for the practical application development is that we uh, support the concept of storage policy. So uh, the user uh, can control where and how the data is stored, uh, not just in some random way you can exactly say how you want it to be stored in the system. And we have the ACL support that works in the distributed environment. So you also have control over the access to your data. Um, so uh, let's move to the key concept. So uh, as I said, the NeoFS stores data in containers so and, and, and objects. So uh, each object uh, is stored in container and uh, the pair of container slash object ID form the address. So you can uh, access any object uh, by its address. Uh, the container has is its ID and actually it's a hash of the container structure. The container structure, uh, it's a storage policy plus some attributes. So just a data structure describing how your data is stored. Uh, an object ID, it's in turn a hash of the header and payload. The header, uh, it's set of attributes and uh, meta information about the object. So uh, both of them are content dependent. So you cannot just change uh, the content without changing the address or the ID. So that uh, makes the new FS a content address storage. So if you access some object, you can make, you can be sure that the content is uh, exactly that you expect. Uh, so the container is something like directory in the file system world or bucket in AWS. And object is like a file that cannot be modified easily. Uh, so the files are stored, the objects are stored off chain uh, on the new storage nodes. So uh, we again, uh, <laughs> do not store any data on chain. Uh, one of the interesting features of the new FS is that we support objects of any size. Uh, so we have the uh, single object limit. And if uh, you try to upload uh, 
an object that is larger than this limit, it will be automatically split into smaller parts. And uh, each of the parts uh, will be uh, accessible and uh, you can even try to range, uh, to read a particular range. Uh, and this works both ways. So you can uh, stream to the system uploading data and downloading data. So you can store, for example, uh, large uh, video files and you do not need to buffer them to, to upload. It will be just done automatically. Uh, and <clears throat> those big objects are treated the same way as regular objects. So that's uh, fully transparent to the user. Uh, so how we achieve the uh, almost infinite scalability here uh, in NeoFS? Uh, we have a concept of network map. Uh, that's one of the, our key concepts. So uh, network map is a structure that is uh, stored on chain and it contains the information about all the network uh, storage nodes active at the moment. Uh, so we record uh, the, the object, the node structure with the, it, its attribute uh, in a compact way. Uh, and then each node can uh, produce uh, the large graph, uh, each dimension of which uh, represents the particular attribute tree. Uh, so uh, based on that uh, network map, uh, you can apply uh, the policy and without any central point of meta information about object location, you can uh, calculate uh, the location of your objects. So this allows uh, the whole system to work uh, really in a really distributed way, uh, fully in parallel without any single point uh, of failure or uh, in a central meta information bottleneck. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, here, uh, we can once again mention that uh, the network map is maintained by in-ring nodes and the storage node nodes just to use it to, to store the data and find its neighbors. Uh, so this structure allows us to define uh, the storage policy, uh, which means we can uh, uh, formulate the rules uh, based on the nodes attributes that uh, declare how we want our data to be stored. So here's uh, the simple uh, policy, for example, that uh, says uh, I want to store two replicas uh, on our nodes uh, with a backup factor equals one. Uh, and our nodes means uh, four nodes from the NSPCC. And NSPCC is the filters uh, all the nodes which have attribute deployed, which is equals NSPCC. So the same way you can, uh, for example, define I want to store all my data in Japan and US on two nodes. So uh, the, the, the structure will be, the, the graph will be uh, cut into the tree for the objects, for, for the attributes you search for. And you will, the, the algorithm will choose uh, deterministically the nodes that should be hosting your objects. Uh, so the storage policy itself uh, uh, is one of the major features, features that allow to uh, control the data. Uh, uh, it's we have uh, a quite simple and powerful way to define the policy in a binary form, and it can be transformed into the SQL-like uh, policy uh, description language, uh, JSON, Blockly, or almost anything else. So you can define particularly uh, what uh, number of replicas and where do you want to store and uh, choose the exact number of nodes. Uh, uh, with a backup factor and filter, so, so you can control uh, on a very fine level uh, where you want to store your data. You can select even you want to store all the data on your own nodes without interacting with public nodes that you may not trust. Um, and if you do not trust uh, the external nodes, uh, we have the data audit uh, embedded into the system. It's a quite an interesting mechanism uh, of the edu uh, auditing the data without data disclosure. Um, so we have a special structure called the storage group. So if you want to protect some set of objects, uh, you put them in a special structure, which is called the storage group, uh, which uh, 
uh, technically just enumerates uh, uh, the objects under protection uh, and calculates a homomorphic hash of them uh, to be used as a zero knowledge proof uh, at the audit stage. Uh, so uh, when you perform the audit, uh, the inner ring nodes uh, uh, selects uh, uh, some storage group to check, uh, selects uh, uh, objects uh, enumerated there and asks the nodes that are supposed to store those objects to calculate the uh, homomorphic hash of each object and then uh, it summarizes them uh, and uh, the resulting hash should match uh, the homomorphic hash in the storage group. Then uh, at this stage, we make sure that uh, all the objects are available if the nodes do not cheat. And on the next stage, we uh, figure out if nodes are cheating. We have the small k. We, uh, uh, we find the minimal coverage uh, of that uh, set of objects by the nodes. So we find, find pairs of nodes that, that share some objects and ask them to uh, to send the hashes of the random parts of that object that intersect. So because we use homomorphic hashing, uh, here uh, we can, uh, we ask each node to calculate three uh, different parts uh, so that each two parts of one node, uh, if merged, uh, will result in the one part of the other node's uh, hash. So, um, this uh, makes almost uh, impossible to to guess uh, to guess the answer beforehand, uh, and it's economically uh, meaningless to to try to to cheat. Uh, uh, so, um, next to the access control list, uh, compared to the other distributed storage system, we have uh, the working access control list. So we have the basic. Uh, control list which are immutable and attached directly to the container so when you create a container you can uh, set up the simple uh, access rules uh, it looks like uh, the unix uh, file system permissions so you have verbs uh, available for the neofs like getting objects getting head put delete search etc and you can set if it's allowed to do by the user by the system by others or uh, you can uh, allow to set this by bureau token. Uh, uh, and you can extend this uh, by uh, using the extended ACL. If the basic ACL is immutable, uh, the extended ACL is mutable. You can update it. And to avoid conflicts and races, uh, we synchronize the uh, extended ACL changes on chain, but on the side chain. So uh, it will not affect the main net, uh, the, the, the main chain uh, that's done on the NeoFS sidechain, which technically is the same Neo N3 uh, synchronized, uh, synchronized with, uh, you know, with the main chain, just for technical technical purposes. Uh, so uh, in, access, in extended access control list, uh, you can uh, have uh, very rich set of rules uh, that can uh, you can filter any uh, parameters of the object or request and match them uh, to some uh, set of uh, user keys so for example or uh, anything else so you can uh, set uh, the rule to allow access to some particular object which should be named like secret uh, file uh, to only request signed with a particular key. And this will work in a distributed way. So uh, that's a quite a powerful mechanism. Uh, so for example, uh, you have the bureau token uh, mechanism, which can substitute the extended ACL for particular request. So that's just like JWT tokens for authorization uh, and uh, you can use the, the bureau token for example to uh, issue some token on the back end of the application and forward it to your front end and uh, create the request that will be passed uh, through the http gate uh, 
uh, in the form of a cookie or just a HTTP authorization header. And it will be transparently uh, used uh, in the uh, resulting NeoFS request. Uh, so you can uh, use it to integrate your authentication uh, system like OAuth uh, to the mobile client, for example, and still use the NeoFS uh, as a backend. Um, so now I, I want to uh, pass the word to, to my colleague, Alexei, who is a lead NeoFS, uh, who, who's leading the NeoFS development. And uh, he will show you uh, some practical uh, use cases of NeoFS. And then we can uh, switch to possible uses uh, of the NeoFS as a part of your application. Hi everyone, thank you Stanislav. My name is Alexei and I'm software developer head of NeoFest development at NeoSPCC. And today I'm going to present you some practical introduction of NeoFest. Yesterday we pre-recorded screencast on the running entry testnet and it consists of two parts. In the first part, we will go through the basic communication with NeoFS using NeoFS CLI and HTTP gate. And uh, in the second part, we will look at NeoFS API library and we will use it to manage the basic ACL of the container. Today, we won't cover complex topics of bearer token or session tokens or native contract oracle calls. Okay, let's begin. Um, to start working with NeoFS to store data or to host your own storage node, you need to make a deposit first. This deposit will be used to register you in NeoFS identity contract, in NeoFS sidechain, and then you can spend gas to store your data. Well, uh, I think everyone here is some kind of familiar with Neo blockchain, and to demonstrate all blockchain related things, uh, I will use NeoGo. This is a testnet RC3 compatible version. However, you can use a native C-sharp node or any wallet application you want. So you can get uh, NeoGo from our repository NSPC dev slash NeoGo. Okay. Um, here I have a entry testnet wallet, mywallet.json. So I will. I want to use it in uh, NeoFS. So I have an address right here. So to make a deposit, you need uh, first of all a testnet uh, gas to do that. So you can get some testnet gas using faucet service at neowish.ngd.network, and it can gives you up to five hundred gas in testnet once a day. So I prepared beforehand and uh, let's check how many gas I have in my wallet. Okay, I got 100 gas in it and free testnet. So I think it should be enough to make a deposit. So let's do that. To do that, we should transfer some gas right into NeoFS contract in testnet. Uh, at uh, NeoFS, neospc.media.com, we have uh, several articles about uh, NeoFS and how you can uh, work with it in a testnet. So how you can deploy your own storage node uh, about HTTP gateways, Oracle calls, but uh, we are interested in a beginner's guide. So let's look through it. We will scroll down up to deposit section. Here it is. And here we have a smart contract address of NeoFS smart contract in testnet. So all we have to do is to transfer some gas in this address. There is a limitation with uh, up to 9,000 9, gas in one transaction but uh, to register in NeoFS chain identity contract, you need at least one guess. 
So we specify our wallet address here and we send, for example, 10 gas. Okay, great. We made the deposit uh, and now we are ready to work with a new FSCLI. So NeoFest CLI is a part of NeoFest node repository. So you can get that from a release page or you can build it on your own by cloning the NeoFest node repository. So um, I'll do that because master uh, CLI in the master branch has enhanced support of JSON wallets. So uh, I'll use it. We're gonna release it soon. So take a sneak peek on how you can work with NeoFest CLI. Let's check the balance, if our deposit succeed or not. Uh, every new FSCLI command requires to have a storage node endpoint. So uh, there are at least four storage nodes in the testnet right now. It is st1.storage.fsnetwork. It is st1, st2, st3, st4. So you can use any of those endpoints to try it on your own. So uh, we have 10 gas that we deposited, so we can go next. As Stanislav said, uh, all objects are stored in the containers. So let's make a new container. Um, create a container is a paid operation. So that's why we need uh, at least one gas uh, to do that. Containers also define placement policies, uh, rules on how you store the data. Uh, you can read more about placement policies in the specification. So in this example, we specified pretty simple policy. So we have uh, two copies of the object, uh, first line replication two. Uh, we specify uh, container pickup factor as one, so container won't be expand. And the container will consist of four nodes. Uh, we do not specify what kind of nodes it will be, like for any nodes. So with that placement policy, we are ready to create the container. So we will use container create command. As I said, we need to specify endpoint to storage node. And also provide uh, credentials. So we are still working with myWallet.json. Also, we need to specify the basic ACL. Uh, we have uh, plenty of predefined uh, basic ACL rules like private basic uh, private container, uh, uh, public to read, uh, public to read and write. So, but I used here the hexadecimal version of basic ACL uh, just to point that uh, this is a public read write container. As you see, uh, all operations have F, so all four bits are set. But the first number zero is zero is unset. So we unset a final bit of the basic cell, and this will this will provide uh, to expand container with uh, additional extended cell rules. So we are going to do that in the second part. Creating container takes a bit of time. So uh, it uh, generates some transaction in the side chain. So as soon as they enter the block, uh, the container will be created. Okay. So I have a picture of a nice uh, wild uh, Siberian cat. Uh, it's called Manu. So I want to upload it to my container and I'll use it. I'll use NeoFSCLI for that. So now it is command object pod. We use container ID that we created on a previous step. Then we need to specify a path to the file. And again, uh, NeoFS storage node endpoint and uh, wallet credentials.
Okay, seems that our object is stored in the container and uh, now we can access it through the HTTP gate. So we have a public uh, HTTP gate available at http.fs.neo.org. Oh, and in the URL, you need to specify container ID slash object ID. And here is our cat. It is available through the web. You can host pictures, videos, uh, even the whole website. And as soon as we created a public container, uh, we can try to access data not only from the mywallet.json, we can generate any wallet and uh, get the data. So in this example, we're trying to get metadata of the object with a freshly generated key. And here it is, uh, there is some metadata about our manual cat. So that's the uh, end of the first part. In summary, we made a deposit to NeoFS account. We created the container with placement policy to store data in two copies on a subset of four nodes. We uploaded the object with the CLI and get these objects from HTTP gate. Okay, let's try something different. Managing objects with a CLI is quite easy. However, managing extended SL is not so trivial. Uh, let's try something more complex. So maybe we want to upload a secret object to our container and we can expand uh, extended SL list uh, with some rules. So this object will be available only for a specific wallet, special wallet, but uh, for everyone else, uh, access will be denied. So we can do that and we can manage uh, extended ACL list of the container right from the Go application. And we will use directly NeoFS API for that. So speaking of NeoFS API, it is also located in our NeoFS API repository. We tried to design it for future enhancement and simple multi-language implementation. And uh, that's why we used protocol buffer definition. So as you can see, pretty much all of the API is a uh, protobuf structures. Like here, we can see object related structures and services. So all NeoFS nodes and clients are talking with each other through this, uh, through these RPCs. And uh, according, besides of API repository, we also have API Go repository. So as you can guess, it is a uh, it is a generated code from protobuf files and it has some uh, wrappers uh, around uh, auto-generated structures from protobuf and the main part of it is a client. So we will use uh, this client to access uh, data of NeoFS through our app. So I got here a short NeoFS example. It's, uh, it will be a small application that will uh, change our uh, extended ACL, but right now we're doing nothing. So if you're afraid of Go, don't be afraid because it's very simple language and you, uh, you will understand how it's gonna work, uh, I think perfectly. So we have a main function that is pretty empty doing nothing. And I have a predefined open wallet function. So actually you can work with the wallets uh, any way you want. You can uh, parse uh, VIVs, you can read uh, hex uh, binary uh, private keys, uh, but uh, the safest way to work with uh, wallets is to not use VIVs and not use private keys. Uh, just open wallet to read it uh, there and code it. And uh, this is a safe way. 
So what we're going to do in this application? Uh, we need to update extended ACL list of our container. And to do that, we need to read credentials of container owner account. So if this is my wallet.json we used previously, we need to read credentials of uh, our special account. We need to parse container ID and just do the thing, update extended ACL of this container. Right now we don't have any special wallets. So let's create one. We can do that with NeoGo in a moment. Let's name it special. And now we're going to, to give access for a secret file to this wallet. So first of all, let's uh, read credentials from mywallet.json. Open wallet function takes a path to the wallet. So it's mywallet.json. And as in CLI, we need to specify the wallet address. So you can get it with one command. So here's the address we used in the previous showcase. And now we'll do the same thing for the special wallet. Here's the address of the special wallet. Okay, we got credentials. Uh, now we want to try to parse container ID. We will use uh, the same container ID that we stored Manu in. So here's our gorgeous Manu, and this is a container ID we created. Okay. And to update extended ACL list, uh, we need to create the API client. So this is a client that will connect our application with uh, NeoFS nodes di directly. So we need to import our client library. Now it is stored in NeoFS API Go repository, but uh, soon it will be moved uh, into SDK because uh, it's mostly SDK thing. Okay, let's create a client. Uh, it is very easy. So you need to just uh, use a constructor and provide a couple of options. So first option is an address of the endpoint we're going to communicate with. And uh, this is the same endpoint we specified in NeoFS CLI commands. So for example, st2.storage fs neowork this endpoint does not have TLS configuration, so we just ignore that. And also we need to specify the private key. So we are going to change the basic ACL of the container we created with mywallet.json. So we specify this private key uh, so we can access to change uh, extended ACL list. Okay, now we are ready to finally make some changes in container. We will do that uh, with the, in a different function so it will be easier to read. Okay, uh, the only thing we need to do is to call our client that we created. So we can pass uh, context and the client. Context is a Go related thing. So you can ignore that if you don't familiar with Go. So this client actually implements uh, many functions uh, that can uh, work with objects, with containers, and also with uh, extended ACL, so there is a function set e, e ACL, and it takes two parameters, the context and 
the actual table of ESA rules. So we need to create one. And we're gonna set up rules from this table. We need to connect this table with our container. So let's pass container ID as an argument. Okay. So what is it? The ICL table. Basically, it's a table of records that have some rules inside, and they are applied one by one. So every record consists of uh, several things. First of all, it is action. Should we ally or deny, deny access? It contains service operation, object service operation, get, put, head, etc. It contains uh, filters and targets for these specific EACL rules. So for our purposes, we need to create two records. The first one should give access to the secret file for the special account. And the second one should deny access to all others uh, requests. So this way, nobody except the special account will be able to get our secret object. So let's do that. Uh, we just need to create a new record. So as the action for record one, it should be it should be allow, and the operation is get. So we want to allow to get the object for our special account and deny get for others. We don't want to mention with other objects, so we need to filter, to add a filter, and uh, this filter will be. Uh, pretty simple. We want to check if the object has attribute file name with the value secret.jpl. So any other objects will not uh, be influenced by that record. So as the target of this uh, rule, uh, we want to specify the public key of the our special account. So we can do that just providing the public key. Okay, we are done with the first record and the second record will be pretty much the same, but we will need to tweak a couple of things. So first of all, the action is now denied we keep the same operation and the same object filter. And now the target is uh, not uh, our special wallet, it's just any other's requests. Okay, that's it. Now we attach those records to the EACL table. And now we are ready to, no, not yet. We, we need to <laughs> invoke this function we just defined. And after that, we are just ready to, to try it in a testnet. So we provide all arguments we need. The context is a client, is an identification of container and a public key of our special account. All right, so we are done. Now we can try to run our application. So it requires the password from my wallet JSON and special JSON, and seems it works. Okay, uh, this operation also requires some time to be accepted on the side chain, the same way as a container creation. But uh, until that, we can upload our secret object. 
with the new SCLI. We know how to do that. The same way we specify the endpoint and the wallet credentials. Okay, the object is uploaded. So right now, if we try to access this object with the HTTP gate, we will fail because uh, extended ACA list just denies access to get this object from any other uh, requests besides of requests from secret uh, wallet, special wallet. So we can do that. However, let's try to get object with new SCLI using our special wallet. So to, the, to get the object, we need to specify the container ID and the object ID. So let's save our object in the opensecret.jpg file. And we specify special wallet credentials. All right, so we are succeed. So we can just open our secret and here it is. Okay, uh, you can find actually more examples on how to use API client in the source code of NeoFest CLI. Uh, so you can find it at NeoFest node CMD NeoFest CLI. We have plenty of models a service in API and uh, so for example there is an object related commands container etc so I can look into that and uh, CLI actually uses the same new face API client and does pretty much the same thing as we try it in our application okay that's it in this showcase, we upload secret object and gave access only to a special wallet that we just created with extended ACL. And this ACL can be measured directly by invoking new VS API RPCs. On this note, back to you, Stanislav. Thank you. Um, let me share the screen again. Okay, <clears throat> uh, so uh, next, uh, let's see some practical, possible practical uses uh, of NeoFS. So uh, we have a demonstration service called NeoFS Send. Uh, right now, uh, it's not available because we, uh, re uh, we are relaunching it for uh, N3 testnet and plan to, to have it uh, uh, open for the public next week uh, or something like that. Uh, so uh, let us just uh, describe what, uh, how you can, uh, at a high level, how you can uh, integrate uh, NeoFS into your app or D app. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> here, technically, the, the, the NeoFS uh, uh, is a set of nodes, uh, storage nodes uh, that can talk the particular API and uh, if you have uh, the traditional web application, most probably you want uh, to speak through the HTTP gateway uh, to, to, to have the standard uh, protocol uh, used uh, there. Uh, so we have a set of publicly available HTTP gates, uh, which are uh, available at http.fs.neo.org, uh, as uh, you saw in the demonstration from Alexei. Uh, and um, uh, in the uh, NeoFS send application, 
uh, we use those gates uh, to upload objects and to download them. So uh, the front end is uh, hosted uh, again directly in NeoFS. So you can use NeoFS uh, with HTTP gateways as a static page hosting. So for your DApp, uh, you can host your front end uh, in a decentralized way. Uh, you can have your backend. Uh, as a set of uh, smart contracts, uh, again, in a decentralized way. And this makes your dApp uh, really distributed. Uh, so uh, for the NeoFS end itself, uh, uh, it's some kind of a serverless uh, mode dApp because uh, it doesn't have a backend if you just want to anonymously uh, upload or download uh, data. Uh, you can add a backend. Uh, we did this for the uh, OAuth uh, authentication and uh, in case of NeoFS Send, you can uh, authenticate through any OAuth provider, for example, Google or Facebook, uh, get, uh, pr pr provide access to your email address uh, uh, to, to the backend and the backend will issue the bureau token to your front end that will ensure that only uh, the objects uh, properly uh, marked by your hashed email uh, will be allowed to be uploaded to the public uh, NeoFS and containers. So uh, schemes like this uh, can be implemented quite easily uh, because you can uh, forward, you can pass the, the bureau token uh, through the cookie or through the header. So. Uh, for example, you may have the mobile client that takes photos and uploads them uh, to the uh, NeoFS backend container created for the particular user. And uh, from the mobile app uh, standpoint, it will be just the same way, the same user experience as uploading the object to S3 or any centralized store. Uh, you can also have uh, more complicated examples uh, of NeoFS users. So uh, we are preparing uh, the public NeoFS CDN uh, to be launched soon. Um, that will be a substitute for those just, it's just a simple set of HTTP gates we have uh, as a like some kind of demo service. Uh, so you can, for example, use NeoFS as a backend or caching backend for the fully functional CDN. So. Uh, in, in, the, in this new FSCDN scheme, we, we have uh, the set of edge nodes that uh, perform the caching uh, at the edge locally. Uh, and you, they use a level two cache uh, in a distributed way uh, or in, on NeoFS uh, to, to have the uh, regional cache shared between the edges. So uh, you can uh, directly uh, use this uh, from your NeoFS uh, containers and you can place the data uh, near to your users. Uh, you can define it in your storage policy and uh, CDN ages uh, will get your data again uh, quite fast uh, if you beforehand put, uh, put it uh, into, the near, into the region near to them. Um, uh, for the actual application integration, you can use uh, the API uh, directly uh, through gRPC, through gates. Uh, you can have, uh, you can use the uh, client library, for example, we have uh, the client library in Go. Uh, the NGD uh, developed the client library in C-sharp and uh, maybe we will get the JavaScript libraries soon. Uh, developed and maintained by community, maybe. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I, I hope so. Uh, so there are many ways uh, for uh, fine-grained interaction with uh, NeoFS if uh, just plain uh, use of gateways is not enough for you. Um, so for, maybe that's, that's all for, for now. And uh, we can uh, ask some questions if if you have them. Oh, that's a bonus slide. Sorry. Okay, so Stan, uh, this is all for the presentation part, right? Uh, 
Yes, yes. Well, we have some bonus slide for answering questions uh, if, uh, if if they will arise. Sure thing. So, uh, dear participants, uh, if you have further questions, please raise your hands. I will unmute you. And meanwhile, Stan and Alex, probably you can also look into the chatting room. I think there's also one or two questions like they, they were asked in written way. Okay, so for I, I'll ask the questions from bottom to top. Uh, mm -hmm. So the NeoFS is fast enough to support video streaming. Uh, actually, uh, the screencast uh, you saw uh, was streamed from NeoFS. Uh, so that's fast enough. Um, technically, because we store the, the objects on the nodes themselves, uh, it, it should work at the same speed as any internet node. Uh, for the <clears throat> usage on the real storage hardware, uh, on, the, on the enterprise grade hardware, like uh, not very expensive one uh, with a SATA controllers and 10G, 10G network cards. So we, we had uh, on the four disks, uh, it's like like a gigabyte, one, one dot two gigabytes per second uh, on the small objects, right? Uh, and uh, like the same uh, bandwidth, uh, the same performance on the reads uh, that without any caching. And if you, uh, um, okay, maybe for the performance, I need to share the screen once again. Um, so <clears throat> uh, uh, here's how uh, our storage engine works. Uh, so, um, Compared to the other storage systems, uh, which mostly rely on the plain file system and uh, just do whatever the file system provides, uh, we have uh, a storage engine uh, that uh, works, uh, that represents the storage as, as a set of shard. The shard is a, uh, <clears throat> the HDD plus uh, the SSD for caching and metabase. Uh, so if you, for example, have a server with four HDDs and four SSDs, you uh, create four shards and they work in parallel, uh, uh, having the maximal performance. So on the SSD, you have metadata to quickly locate and uh, uh, perform search requests. Uh, and you have uh, the write cache to uh, quickly, uh, quickly survive the uh, reading and writing spikes. Uh, <clears throat> on the backend, we also separate the small objects and large objects. So uh, large objects are written directly to the disk and the small objects are gathered into the special structures called Blabovnica, uh, which uh, groups uh, small objects to reduce the unnecessary uh, I.O. waste. So instead of uh, writing small objects one by one and have uh, lots of random I.O., uh, we group them together and have uh, the sequential, almost sequential uh, I.O. into the carefully uh, chosen uh, structures uh, on the disks. Um, so internally it works uh, on the same mechanisms of rendezvous hashing uh, as we do uh, globally. Uh, so we survive uh, uh, without any problems uh, uh, the, the death of SSD or HDD, uh, so that's not a problem. Uh, the data inside will be handled the same way as it uh, handled uh, globally. It will be replicated, uh, regenerated. So th the system is self-healing fully from from top from 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 the top to bottom, uh, and this allows us to to have uh, performance uh, at the level of the enterprise-grade object storage, like uh, we try to compare uh, with. Uh, I'm not sure I can say, but well, with, uh, with a modern popular object uh, storages uh, uh, with the same characteristic uh, ch 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 characteristics, uh, we are maybe 10% faster, but uh, we are free and open source. Um, um, 
maybe for the performance, uh, that should answer the question. Yeah, and I can answer the question about <clears throat> hierarchy and granularity uh, in the permissions. Um, actually, in the container, there is no folders or files. So the whole hierarchy is uh, built on top of object attributes. So maybe your object that represents a file has attributes that includes the path in the file system. So uh, the permissions uh, can be, uh, the main thing is to have a strict order of permissions. So in the example you saw earlier, uh, we have the allow permission first and deny permission second. So we couldn't do that backwards because uh, in this case, the secret, uh, secret wallet will match the first deny rule and uh, we won't get uh, a secret object. So uh, speaking of denying a folder, but allowing a file, it can be both way. It depends on how you set up your extended ACL. So if you set up extended ACL the same way as uh, you access some file, you have a rule to access some file on the top and there's a rule to deny files that have prefix of a folder on the bottom, then uh, you will allow access to the file and deny to all others. If it will be in reverse, then allow rule will now be applied. So that's uh, mostly dependent on the on the order of the rules, basically said. And there was one more question about, can I create specific case here on the file in bucket? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we did in the showcase. We had a secret file with some name and we just uh, denied access to the secret file for everyone except special uh, wallet. So the original file, manul.jpg, uh, still was uh, available for everyone. Yeah, so this, uh, the, the standard ACL change, uh, it's uh, made basically by the smart contract in sidechain. So you can do it uh, if you can sign it uh, or uh, redefine the signature rules, you can do it even from the another smart, smart contract uh, technically. So that's opens some <laughs> uh, possibilities to integrate it with uh, like NFT stores or things like that. Okay. Uh, cool. Uh, thank you, uh, Stan and Alexi, for the great presentation today. And also thank you for everyone uh, who uh, participated the session today. So um, I think that's all for today. And if you have further questions regarding your FS, I think you can always uh, uh, reach out on Discord and, and also I think Stan shared the, the contact information. So we, we, we as mentioned at the beginning of the session, we have recorded and will upload to the new uh, YouTube account. And uh, that's all. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you.